Hey folks, good evening. Welcome to the Breakaway Homestead channel. I am your host tonight, Patrick, and my wife will not be in tonight. Let me tell you what happened to my wife today. So it's two o'clock in the afternoon. Eh, nah. Yeah, it's two. Just right before she went and picked up our, our kid. She goes, Patrick, calls me. And if I'm busy, I, I automatically forward the phone call and she gets a kickback saying, your phone wasn't picked up. But if I get three phone calls at one time from, uh, from Megan, I know something's wrong. That third phone call is an indicator. Hey, you have to pick up the phone. Something's wrong. So I picked up the third phone call. I said, hey, what's wrong? She's like, I just got hit. I was like, are you okay? She's like, I'm fine. I got side swipe. So Megan's brand new truck of all of two months got hit today. And on top of that, the dude side swiped her and kept going. It was a hit and run. And uh, and so Megan's a little frazzled right now, and she's not. She's in no condition to be wanting to uh, to be on tonight. Uh, she's she's relaxing, but she's completely okay. She's not hurt or anything like that. She got very lucky because with the way it sideswiped, if it had been a foot to the left or any further over, it would have been a head-on collision. And so I thank God and, and our lucky stars that uh, she's okay. So let's see who's on tonight. We got 11 people watching. You know what, guys? I am so happy to see that more people are watching this show, and I appreciate it. And I hope you learn a little bit. And tonight's show is going to be pretty, pretty good. I think uh, we had some preparation for it, and uh, I think it'll be good. So uh, let's see who's on tonight. Suburban Hillbilly, Full Spectrum. Uh, I don't know if he replied back to my message or not. Uh, Doc Ferris is here. Christy Betts is here. And, uh, and yeah. Uh, Maniac Gammy's Homestead. Hi. Peace back to you. And uh, welcome to the show. Uh, my wife's normally here, Megan, but she's not here tonight. Uh, she's in the other room relaxing. Well, I'm probably watching... Law and order, or something like that. Uh, yeah. Um, so she got home, and so to make her feel better, she got home. As soon as she opened the door, I hand her a beer. I'm like, "There you go. You deserve a beer at least." And uh, I gave I gave her a hug, handed her a beer, and said, "All right, I'm leaving." She's like, "Where are you going?" So I'm going to pick up Chinese food, because that's the one thing she wants. She doesn't want to have to cook. She wants to do anything like that. Speak of the devil. There's my lady. There's the uh, the victim. The something. What's up? I need a book. You need a book? I Just a book? I need big space. <clears throat> to cut onto? No, to push on. Okay, onto. dude, don't be cutting on my books. I'm not cutting on your books. Hey, everybody. So, we're just telling. I'm just explaining the whole situation. Doc Ferris is on, too. Your cat is fine. <laughs> That's uh, Bing Crosby. Crosby. There's Bingers. Say hi to Daddy Jeff. Say hey, Bingers. Hey, baby. Bing Crosby. Such a great cat, too. He's such a good cat. And just doesn't give a damn. Really doesn't. Oh. No. Got 15 people watching right now, huh? Nice. That's pretty good. Everybody says, hey there, Miss Megan. Hope you're doing well. Hope you're okay. Um, yeah, she's not injured, I don't think. But she's going to go get checked out tomorrow I'm morning. Sore. And if she's sore, she'll probably go to the chiropractor and maybe do some adjustments, whatnot. But hopefully, we'll get some information. Whatever it is, I got the dude's mirror, the side, side mirror that she picked up and we know it's a 2007 to 2009 Chevy Silverado so you watch yourself if you're out there oh he's out there oh he's out there he's out there oh I'm done yeah I'm okay. going back alright she's going back y'all 
Say night to Megan because she's not gonna be back for the rest of the night. I'm not. No. Yeah. Sub says she's glad you're okay. Thank you. Uh, Amanda said that's my kind of cat. Yeah, she's great. She's a good Beep. cat. Huh? It's a boy. It's a boy. He's a good cat. So, um, so we have USAA. We have insurance. We got all the nine yards, so we're covered under that that front. Uh, how much we're gonna pay out of pocket, or if my insurance is gonna go up? That all depends on if they catch this guy or not. Um, so that's what happened today, and that's why Megan's not here. Oh, uh, police report was done. She stayed on the scene. I t I asked her why she didn't chase him, but she was too frazzled to do such a thing. And she, she stayed in place uh, and uh, waited for a cop to arrive. Uh, so state police showed up. They took the report. The report was done through uh, our insurance, and uh, and that's pretty much it. Everything that could have been done has been done. The only thing that hasn't been done, which I'm kicking myself in the ass for, was getting a dash cam installed on on her truck. Because uh, most vehicles we have have a dash cam in them. Uh, and I would encourage you folks to get yourself a dash cam. They're not expensive. You can get a decent dash cam for 30 bucks these days that, that just does a continuous loop. And if anything happens, you'll at least have evidence of that situation so um so yeah that happened today anything else going on okay so well, there's no giveaway tonight and there's a reason why there's no giveaway tonight normally I give away an ebook of some sort uh, that's because I am down to specific genres of ebooks and this is more of a homesteading site. We do talk about SHTF situation, but not nearly enough as uh, as homesteading. But uh, I have several books that are left over that I have to give away. But maybe I'll give them away on Full Spectrum Survival's show uh, next time we do a collab. Because uh, I got an SHTF anthology. This is about a guy named uh, Selko uh, Beganovic. He uh, survived the Balkan Wars and uh, uh, went through a lot. Uh, the dark secrets of, of survival, you know, why preppers are going to die, stuff like that. You know, the negative impact and the prepper side of things uh, on uh, preparation, uh, not the homesteading side. So maybe we can give those away or I'd give them to Brad. Brad can give them away on his show uh, from Full Spectrum Survival. And, uh, yeah, we'll work it out that way. Uh, so there's no giveaway tonight. Yeah, Brad says that'd be cool. Uh, no giveaway tonight. So um, uh, that's the reason why. But I will be working on getting more material to get out to you folks. And uh, really need to get back on my website and continue to update that. Because we are going into spring. Let me tell you what happened today. Okay, I live in the middle of North Carolina. <clears throat> uh, it was it was a little sprinkly this morning, and then it got dark, and then it got cold, and then it started snowing. Yeah, actually snowing, and, uh, <clears throat> and then it started sleeting, and then it got clear, and then it got sunny, and now it's warmer now than it was the entire day, and tomorrow it's going to be a high of 75. How crazy is that? And uh, if you ever ever watched Dave Chappelle when he does the the guy who who's addicted to crack and he's always scratching his neck, he's like, "You got any more of that cocaine?" And I was like, "You got any more of that global warming?" Because it was cold today, uh, surprisingly enough. And then tomorrow it's gonna be like a light switch; it's gonna be warm again, and everybody's gonna be sick. Good thing about it, the pollen here has been ridiculous. The tree pollen, because we live in the in the pine hills or the uh, the pine uh, area and pine pollen is so big it gets all over everything turns everything yellow and you got to wash that away at least for now so we're happy about that and today our um, uh, our trees are starting to bloom the state uh, state flower for North Carolina is also a tree what's it called 
I can't think of it off the top of my head. Um, Um, it's on the tip of my tongue. I cannot get it. Um, so, so, full spectrum mass, what's happening with a quail? So, quail are doing good. We still have 19. We lost one probably about two weeks, three weeks ago. Uh, we were moving the, the quail cage to a different location because what I'm doing is I'm rotating it throughout my backyard. And as we rotate it, I'm throwing down some uh, white clover on the ground in hopes that it'll grow into a clover patch. So eventually my whole backyard is going to be clover. Now, I don't want a backyard that's going to have to be mowed or anything like that. And clover, I think, has a maximum length of like 18 inches, which is maybe like that high. And uh, But normally it sits around 9, 10 inches, which is fine with me. I'm not doing anything out back there. Plus, if I'm out back in my backyard with no shoes on or anything like that, I'll be happy to run through some clover like that. Plus, it's going to be good for my bees, which I don't have any right now. But I ordered bees, which will be in uh, between now and the beginning of May. So, I ordered a new incubator um, in hopes of raising some quail. And so they're putting out about a dozen dozen eggs a day, a dozen quail eggs, which are little tiny little eggs, about the size, a little smaller than the ping pong ball. Uh, about four or five of them will make one egg, but they're rich, they're great. I've been pickling them uh, with uh, uh, Big Bear Homesteads pickling. Uh, they do a Cajun pickle, uh, and they're really good. Make you fire a lot, but uh, they're good. Uh, dogwood thank you very much Amanda I appreciate it yeah full spectrum said the weather is wild she said Amanda said don't come to Florida then laugh out loud chip signal the nor'easter that just left Florida is getting stronger north of us but moving east to the Atlantic uh, Gamal's garden says good evening good evening grandma's I'm going to suggest uh, Chip is in Florida I do believe and uh, we'll check the chat in a bit finishing up final season seasoning of some cast iron I'm preparing for a friend and horse shoe trivets that's cool good evening at Chip Signal by the way I replied to all uh, to that cooking video so we're going to talk tonight about meat preservation and I'm going to have a sip of my drink here before we do that, wet the whistle, get it going, and we're going to talk about meat preservation. So we are growing as a homestead. Currently, we have chickens, we have quail, and we have rabbits. Of course, we have dogs, cats, so on and so forth, but we won't eat them unless we have to wink full spectrum survival. Um, so... Um, Yesterday we did something to start a new chapter in our homesteading experience. We have 11 rabbits, four, four males, and seven uh, females. And the intent, the very beginning intent was to have two males and four females, which we will draw that back down uh, to that. Uh, one of those males belongs to Doc Ferris. I have to take it up to him. When I bring him up his uh, new, uh, uh, new used, uh, uh, wood stove, which is burning away right now because I built a fire for Megan as well, because I knew it'd make her feel better. And, uh, so the goal is to get that fireplace out, uh, Doc Ferris and, uh, get that onto some Harbor Freight rollers. And eventually either the end of this month or the beginning of next month, come up there to you guys and get that to you. Uh, looking forward to that uh, so we have to make some plans there so um, we bred our rabbits yesterday our female rabbits are six months old and six months uh, four months is actually no back that up reverse it anyway uh, our male rabbits are six months old male rabbits for a prime breeding age starting age is six months 
for a female rabbit, it's four months. And so the male rabbits have approached six months. And so the, the female rabbits are about five months, five and a half months, somewhere around there, uh, close to six months. And, uh, and so we were just waiting for the male rabbits to be mature enough to breed with the female rabbits because they were older than the male rabbits. And so uh, we had them bred yesterday. We bred all of our rabbits over the past two days because we only have three actual breeding males because the fourth breeding male is one from a litter that I got way after I got the other rabbits and it's too young yet. Yeah. So three other, uh, so the rabbits went in over the course of two days with these three or four male rabbits or three male rabbits and so what we have to look forward in the next month because it takes up to 31 days for gestation is rabbits to be piling in and by that time we will have that base number we'll have four females two males and uh, we'll be good to go and ready for uh, for receiving uh, rabbits and rabbits will average average pop out meat rabbits these are mutt rabbits there's one there's one specific Flemish giant that we're working on it with right now hoping that that she took because it's so huge that our smaller rabbits might not have bred properly we don't know uh, but we tried them all and uh, and so getting caught up in myself we expect uh, a, an average meat rabbit will lay lay will birth about eight uh, eight kits or eight uh, baby rabbits and so this is the time this is their first run we're gonna see how they are as mothers uh, we're gonna record how they are as mothers how they birth if it was difficult if they have more or less how many survive so on and so forth so we can start determining its breeding quality for rotation so if we get a rabbit that's that's not putting out a lot of rabbits so let's say we have a rabbit first time up puts out three babies all right we're gonna follow that rabbit for the next next gestation cycle and the next time it has babies if it only has three babies there's more likely an issue and that rabbit can't handle the load of having more than three babies and so that rabbit will be rotated out and a new female will be put into its place and uh, and that's how that's gonna work but I digress we're not here to talk about rabbits we're here to talk about meat processing or meat uh, preservation so in my notes here yesterday marked another step in our experience and will open many doors to come we bred our female rabbits. We will be expecting baby bunnies May 1st, which happens to be our anniversary. Uh, talk about an anniversary present. Uh, our female should produce around 32 bunnies total. Because there's only going to be four female rabbits that are going to be producing, right? So 32 bunnies. That is a lot of mouths to feed. In turn, it will also be a lot of meat in our freezer. Which is what our show is about tonight. Meat preservation. Meat preservation is, some, somewhat, uh, is something that has been going since the dawn of man. First, we are going to go through the timeline of preservation. And then we're going to talk about each of the ways to preserve your product. The point of preserving food is to keep food safe to eat later. Preservation. Uh, back in the day, this took ingenuity and creativity. The old ways is to keep it cool, keep it in the dark, and keep it dry and that's how you preserve your meats and so let me pull up my slideshow and bam open this up and I'm gonna move over let's move over the other way yeah yeah all right all right, all right. we're going this way and I'm gonna move over all right So, maybe I'll do this a little bit. Let's see if I do that, then it's all jacked up. All right. Okay. Does anybody have a guess with what this is? Chip Signal said a friend accidentally got 24 rabbits at auction for $4. <laughs> well, okay. Here's your problem. 
you got people out there that think rabbits are, are cute little fuzzy bunnies that uh, you know should should be little hippity hoppities all the, like they don't pee they don't poop they don't do anything anything like that and uh, so for those people it's difficult because they don't know what to do with an animal like that uh, for people who have raised them for a living or when the, I, I had them in my house when I was a kid uh, you can easily turn around and sell them on Craigslist or you can butcher them you can eat them and people are squeamish to the fact that they don't want to know where their food comes from and they they don't want to see the process of how their food gets to them so it's difficult for people to just say yeah I want to see a day in the life of the food that's on my plate for me I think it should be mandatory and necessary that a, a kid of age 12 plus uh, should see the process from the beginning all the way to the dinner plate and on top of that for the future farmers of America which they do do that they raise it for auction they sell it at auction of course what happens after that depends on the person who buys it however comma finish that loop and they'll know exactly how, how it worked and they'll have a better sense and a better form of pride for not only how that meat's raised, but uh, um, you know the process it takes to do that. And so, this is a root cellar, cold cellar. Deborah E got it. Uh, chip signals is entrance to the center of the earth. That's part of it. Uh, Kristen Bet says no. It says it's a smoker. It's not. So Chip Signal said he slaughtered and skinned them, and the same night, up until 4 a.m., he said good. Um, if his wife wasn't too happy because she had to help and stay up all night, laugh out loud. Well, I guess that's a good reason not to want to do it again. But he gained experience from that. That's cool. Cool to me. So Dagger E got it right. It's a cold cellar. And a cold cellar or, or a root cellar is what it's called. Excuse me. A root cellar is um, it's a room that's covered in earth that has a little bit of moisture in it, but not too much. It's dark. Oh, I am just going way too far, aren't I? Did I do this right? No, oh, all jacked up now. All right, I'm gonna pause this here real quick and look at my uh, image slideshow numbers and make sure it's in order because it should be in order. 1.5, 1. 1.51, and I'm gonna take a look at this order again. Yeah, 1.51. Huh. All right. It looks to be in order. Save. But why isn't it in order? All right, let's find this. One. So apparently it's the format, but what I was going to do is show you guys exactly what is in there. So I'm going to go ahead and share my my screen and show you exactly what the inside of a um, here's a display capture. That's my other screen, guys. If you don't know what's on my other screen, I got more than one cat up my sleeve. All right. So root cellar doesn't necessarily have to be a building or a cellar underground or, or out of a building or anything like that. It could be something that could be made uh, in your own backyard. And what it is, it's putting it in the ground where it's not above the frost line. 
and when you do that it acts as a cooler to that particular item it does it keeps it uh, above the freezing mark uh, but doesn't go go below the freezing mark so here this bucket of carrots it's in a plastic bucket is encased in earth and has a thick layer of insulation on top of it in this case it's a hay or straw bale and it is keeping refrigerated to the proper temperature but not freezing and that's what a root cellar is all about uh, here's your build your build your root cellar store produce from a from your garden let me see if I can make this bigger for you guys BAM so it's north facing window side so this is somebody who made a root cellar out of their basement uh, so all the walls are insulated the north facing window of his basement is covered and the reason why it's faced north is because if you ever ever need light you can open it uh, but it's faced north which is not uh, facing south which is the the side of the building that the sun's going to be beaming down upon and so it's got a little uh, little gauge here that's probably a um, gauge to manage the moisture inside the room the floor is covered in coarse gravel and I'm going to guess that uh, this particular basement has a dirt floor uh, which will have natural moisture to go inside the room. Uh, exterior wall is not insulated, but everything else is insulated, which creates basically a large cooler that you put your drinks in when you go out and whatnot. It insulates the food in a cool, dry location that makes your food last longer. It preserves it longer. So, I'll bring that down. play capture and put this one back up and we're going to move on to the next item and I'm going to pull my chat back up so we can see what's going on here uh, I've been trying to look into new methods to do my own food storage good I hope you learned something new tonight I guarantee you you'll learn at least one thing new uh, through tonight's presentation uh, so next up is anybody know what gosh these are not in order all right then looks like I'm heading back to my actual picture slideshow display capture put that back up there and pictures Anybody know what this is? I'm going to go ahead and pull up my actual here. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it, Chasing Life. I hope you do. And the whole point of this show is to, you know, is to spread some knowledge okay you guys can do this too this is not just me I'm just your normal everyday Joe uh, that you know just wants to spread the word on you know preservation on uh, animal husbandry your rights as an individual uh, your American rights your God given rights uh, you know you should all be talking with each other and getting out there to meet new people and learn new things and uh, YouTube is a great catalyst to learn new things but it's gonna get more and more restricted as we go on a few things but this right here is called a spring house Chris you got it right so a spring house um, root cellars I don't have a date for them uh, they've been mentioned throughout history uh, same thing with spring houses I don't have a date for them either I cannot find a specific uh, early date for it saying that hey this was when spring houses started this is when people thought this was a good idea so a spring house is a it's it's a compound word it's it's spring and house and you can see here on this on this uh, I'm all backwards here you can see here on this um, this picture there's an actual waterway going through part of the house. And I'm going to move it to the next picture here. If I can. 
bring it back down. Apparently that's what I got to do to move it on to the next picture. And bring this up. So you see here, this is the inside of a spring house, and it has an actual actual spring water going through. And this can be done with a, a stream that's from a spring or an actual spring itself. And this is water going through the spring house. And what this does is it cools this as it's running. It's also evaporating water, which is creating a cool effect inside this particular house, right? So it keeps it cool inside there. Average spring temperature of water, spring water. Uh, I, I can't give you precise. Uh, I'd, I'd lie if I tell you a, a direct uh, temperature, but I want to say somewhere between 50 and 70 degrees. And uh, depending on where you go, I lived in Texas, and that water was uh, about 65 degrees uh, uh, off the San Marcos River. So it was a spring-fed river, and it was about 65 degrees all year round. And so imagine keeping food particularly cool. And people would preserve their foods by not only putting their, their foods inside this house, but also placing them inside the water. And it's that, that's what the cooling part of it was, was the spring water. And I got another, another picture here of what the inside of a spring house looks like. Now this is an older spring house. It's lost its roof, but the concept is still the same. You can see here, you have a spring, spring water flowing through the house, which kept this area cool. This could have also been some sort of bathhouse or whatnot, uh, but I'm pretty sure because it was a spring house at one point that you know you could put if you, if it's sealed, you could put it inside the water um, and be good to go. So the next thing we're going to talk about is. Let's go ahead and see who can guess this one. Well, obviously it says what it is. But uh, we're finally reach, reaching the timeline where we have actual historical evidence of what, uh, what time frames these things were in. And so let's check this chat real quick. All right. Uh, City Girl Country Heart said that would be nice if I had a basement. Um, do you feel? Chip Segel said again, it's an entrance to the center of the earth. Uh, spring house, spring house. Yep. Christy Betts said they kept the milk cold, so there's someone there with experience. Uh, so this is an ice house, folks. Um, ice, house, ice houses were a concept that started in the 1660s. And um, what, what had happened, what the procedure was, was during the wintertime, ice would be placed inside of a highly insulated location house, usually underground because, again, like the, uh, the root cellar, uh, it kept it relatively cool enough to... Uh, to keep the ice over uh, a period of time and they would store it in the winter and it would last roughly through September-ish and they'd wait for the ice to to, uh, to freeze again and they'd start all over again and so let me back up here this is the concept of an ice house You can see the ice blocks right here, and you can see it's got a, a permeable floor, a floor where water can easily go down, and uh, it's well insulated. And what this insulation would do, because these, you know, uh, heat and cold have to transfer to some place. If you keep enough things that are cold stacked up, they're going to stay in their in their uh, temperature state. The ice stayed cold, and the ice stayed frozen for a substantial period of time because of the way it was stacked. Here's a better concept or, or uh, picture of, of how it was done. Uh, a large cylindrical pit was, was, uh, was made underground. It was made out of brick and it had a perennial bottom. They would stack the ice and then they would remove the ice as needed. As the ice melted down, it would go through the brick at the bottom. Uh, 
so there was no water there was no liquid for the ice to pull in to melt it even faster and so again the transfer of, of coolness to heat was very very low so by the time they ran out of ice it was mid-september how cool is that um these ran from the early 1660s all the way up to the 1950s in some northern countries like sweden and norway uh, that's cool it's something local so with ice you guys know it's kind of gonna kind of gonna kind of gonna you guys kind of know what's gonna come up next and that is the Well, here's a picture of uh, people collecting ice. Ice box. The ice box was uh, ice box was invented in 1802. And you would think from the 1660s to 1802 they would have figured that out. And it's weird to me because we have more advancements in the past 120 years than we have had. In a long 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 time almost the history of man right so it took them a long time to figure out ice boxes could be made to keep your household goods cool now think of this guys as the very first refrigerator and let me move on to the next page so you can see exactly how ice box ice boxes work so here's a couple standing in front of their ice box I'm gonna zoom in a little bit you can see the content of this ice box here how it's made how it's set so all the cold cold items would be set on the bottom and on the right hand side and blocks of ice would be stacked on each other and it eventually would melt but because it was insulated it would take a long time to melt just like inside the ice ice house as long as the door was kept shut which is the reason why people say keep the door shut uh, the ice would would take a long time to melt. That ice right there would probably last five to seven days, I would say. Uh, and some folks in here may know what this is, may have people they know that have an ice box. I could tell you a couple that I know that have an ice box just like this. Doug and Stacy uh, from uh, uh, Doug and Stacy, what is their channel name? Um, off the grid homestead what's what is their name all right city girl have a good one terry uh doug and stacy from uh off grid homesteading i want to say gosh they have an ice box they use an ice box they don't have electricity uh so they uh, use an ice box just like this. They use uh, an old-fashioned one just like this. One that's been refurbished. And so think of this as a um, as a modern-day cooler that we use. Off grid with Doug and Stacy. Thank you, sub. I had a brain fart. Uh, but think of this as a modern-day Yeti. This is the Yeti of the of the uh, early 1800s through the early 1900s. And uh, this concept is still valid to this day. Now, my personal opinion, the easiest thing I can make if, 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 uh, if an SHTF situation came up uh, would be ice. They have ice makers that you can run off of solar. Or, I'll take that back. You can run an ice maker off of an inverter from solar from a battery, uh, but you can make ice literally in four minutes. They have ice makers that make ice in four minutes. These are portable ice makers. As long as you can make ice, you can have refrigeration. I want one of these guys. I want I want an old fashioned ice box like Doug and Stacy has, like this right here. So I can make ice and have refrigeration and still be off the grid. Darn little pop-up ads here. So Deborah E said the Ice Man came once a week. So 
Deborah E., would you do me a favor and tell me how long ago you had an icebox? Um, just, I know you might be given a perspective on your age, but it's people like you that should be given info on exactly lost my page here what the details the details are on the ice box um, <laughs> freaky geese says oh thought thought you said run off a of soap not solar laugh out loud yeah it runs off a of soap but 1802 is when this went forward. It went forward through the mid-1900s. And there's actually people inside this chat who actually used an icebox. Pretty cool in my book. Wealth and knowledge there. So moving on here, I'm going to go ahead and push on. Because we have yet to get to preservation. Uh, this is just refrigeration currently. Um, next up was the modern day refrigerator. The very first refrigerator was made in the early 1960s was patented, patented and made in the early uh, 1860s and uh, the first home refrigerator was set and made in the uh, mid 1890s and here's an example of what a refrigerator looks like from early 1900s and late 1800s uh, you can see it wasn't very big that's a that's probably a, a 40 ounce bottle and you can see they weren't very big at all. But that's the very first refrigerators. And you can see it was insulated and it probably kept things cool pretty well. And to have electricity and to have a refrigeration probably was a concept of a rich person. And uh, so that is that is the the timeline of of uh, cooling things down so the next thing we're going to talk about is meat preservation so the thing about it we're having rabbits we're going to probably be freezing the rabbits we're going to you know butcher them at one time uh, grind them up bag them up and freeze them and uh, probably in little two pound containers one to two pound containers this is the reason why the purpose of having meat rabbits is twofold one is to switch our dogs diets to a natural raw diet this is the perfect way if you do rabbits rabbits can be ground whole other than their heads and uh, their feet they can be ground into a meal through a meat grinder bones and all and uh, and so that's probably what will happen. Secondly, our son is intolerant slash allergic to chicken. He can't eat chicken. Uh, he can have eggs, but he can't have chickens. And so this is going to be an alternative of chicken for him. Uh, so we will save a few for the, the crock pot to say. So Deborah E. said she had an icebox in her home in the late 50s. Uh, Freaky Geek says, that meat don't look like bunny to me. Uh, Chasing Life, can you imagine how huge it was back in the time getting a bone, uh, a home refrigerator? Uh, what a difference that it would have made in so many things you think about. And that was something, you know, it was, it was, the, it was, it was a time frame that turned everything hard to everything easy. Now let's let's have a mindset. We need to have a mindset now that everything easy is going to turn back to everything hard. We need to know how to do these things, uh, so we can we can uh, be prepared for that. And so right here, so talking about meat. So uh, talking about preserving meat, the very archaic or the very earliest or easiest or quickest meat preservation method and the quickest and I say the quickest uh, is cooking if you cook meat you're raising the temperature to a point where it kills all the bacteria in that meat and then you consume it 
if you don't consume it, you have two hours to place it into refrigeration where uh, bacteria can grow on it very slowly and it could be two or three days before you could safely eat that without uh, having enough bacteria on it that should get you sick. But the earliest preservation mode was cooking. It killed everything, you ate it right there on the spot. Or you ate it within two hours. So that is a storage time frame. Two hours, okay? Um, next up is going to be drying. Drying meat. What's, what you see right here is called biltong. And biltong is a aged dried meat by hanging um, on a hook of some sort. And uh, I think this is a Brazilian biltong. But uh, biltong is is slathered with a usually a brine and then a dry rub. So it's brined in like almost like a soy sauce saltiness type of brine. And, uh, and then it's rubbed down with pepper, salt, coriander, and then it's just hung. And it hangs and it dries. Uh, so drying meat will take, and this is the one of the oldest methods of, of drying meats or preserving meats, uh, will take roughly 50% of the moisture out. And when I say 50%, I say that the moisture from the outside, the outside would cure, uh, of the meat would cure to the point to where it was the driest part. And so everything on the inside has no, no access to oxygen. And so it's, I'm going to stop you guys real quick. Megan, are you awake? She must be outside. That dog is annoying the crap out of me. And I say that dog, that's our dog that's visiting us. Um, Lucky, which we think might be pregnant. Not from us. Um, but uh, it cures the outside so the inside has no access to oxygen. When you have oxygen interaction, that's when bacteria grows. So this is one of the earliest preservation methods of, of meat. And so again, it dries the meat down to about 50% 50, uh, 50 moisture. So that was uh, drying, and you would say comes with drying comes dehydration. Drying is an old method. Dehydration is actually a modern method. Uh, and that's what they're doing here. They're making uh, beef jerky. And... Our mall verse says salt is awesome for making any meat curing process. We're going to talk about curing here in a second. Uh, Grandma, so happy, Homestead said they store it, store it that way. Absolutely. They store it by hanging it, and it's not coming into contact with anything. If you watch the movie Old Yeller, and you see them hang that deer meat, they, they got a, a leg of deer meat hanging. And as, as time would go by, and they needed deer meat, they'd go outside to this leg that was hanging in a room, and they'd cut the meat off of it. Uh, yes, it, it stays by hanging. It's not coming into contact with anything, so it's not being uh, exposed or the sur to surfaces that may or may not have more deadly viruses or, or bacteria on those surfaces. Yes, uh, she also said that's why I'm putting salt away. That is a very good point. Salt is something you will need in an SHTS scenario for sure because we all need salt. And so this is dehydration. Now this is commercial dehydration. That's taking meat, putting it in a dry environment with a low heat that draws out moisture. Uh, and so with meat, this process will draw out 75% up to 75% of the moisture of the meat um, compared to drying that that's at 50% and so we've all had beef jerky before it's a little rubbery and the reason why it's rubbery is because there's moisture in it um, if you ever eat uh, beef jerky that's crunchy 
that's because it has even less moisture in it. That's you're going into some some old beef jerky there. If that's the case, jerky. Yep, chasing life. Check out Bill Tong, um, uh, Jack Spierko from uh, from the Survival Show. I can't remember the name of it. Jack Spierko put out a Survival Show starting in about two thousand eight, and he was commuting back and forth to his work uh, workplace, but doing these little podcasts, right? And so he came up with a show called. The Survival Podcast. It's still going to this day. One of his favorite methods of preserving meat is called Biltong. And uh, I think he's got a YouTube video on it. But look up Jack Spearco Biltong. If you look that up on YouTube, not on YouTube, excuse me, on Google, it'll either take you to his podcast where he tells you how to make it or it'll take you to his video if he made a video on it. It's called Biltong. Um... So this is dehydration, takes up to 75% of the moisture out from the meat and makes it last that much longer. Now let's talk about exactly how long. I want to say, uh, if I recall, I didn't write it down, uh, but dehydration of meats will make it last for two to three years. Curing of meats will make it last the same two to three years. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about next. Now, there's a difference between dehydration and freeze drying. Freeze drying is is even a more modern process of meat preservation. And a freeze dry will take up to 95% of moisture from uh, meats. The reason why it won't go above 95% is because meat, there is no meat out there that does not have some sort of fat inside of it. And fat goes rancid quickly, but fat also stores moisture better than meat. Uh, so they can't fully dehydrate fat because there's always going to be moisture inside it. So up to 95% of the moisture is taken away during uh, freeze drying. And but freeze drying freeze dried meats I think last up to was it eight to ten years? They don't go to the 20 year mark because that's that's normally what they do, but uh, it's not good for 20 years. Uh, Freeze-dried uh, meats usually go, I think, up to 10 years. Next up, let's see what's up here. Curing. Whoop. You got your cured meats. Curing meat is using a combination of nitrates, salt, and sugar, any of those combinations, or any one of those combinations. Uh, salt is the oldest method. Salt and sugar is the newest method, and or or the uh, the further uh, method. And uh, nitrates is a newer method, uh, and that's why you see bacon with nitrates in it because it helps cure the bacon quicker. Uh, but what will happen is they will pack meat in salt or salt and sugar combination and it will draw out moisture and it will dry out the meat to a point to where that outer layer is uh, is no longer permeable to bacteria uh, you'll see this in Italian cured meats like prosciutto uh, or, or sausage of some sort uh, and uh, it's packed in salt cured and once it's cured then it's uh, deemed safe to eat or safe to store and Italian uh, Italians will make prosciutto and some some prosciuttos can be very very old I've seen I've seen prosciutto I've had prosciutto that's 12 years old and it was fantastic and uh, but it was preserved perfectly in a dry cool spot it wasn't refrigerated but it was it was preserved uh, so next beyond curing is going to be Keep forgetting that I, I have this up here. Uh, canning, canning meats. Can you can meats? Yes, you can can meats. And here's the deal about canning meats: it's going to be in a vacuum-safe environment to inhibit 
the growth of bacteria. That means no oxygen, no growth of bacteria. However, this is the more dangerous way to store meats. The reason being is because of uh, botulism, which can happen in canned foods. Uh, so when you're opening a, any type of canned meat, the best thing to do is follow your nose. If it's rancid, if it stinks, if it's off color, uh, don't eat it. Throw it away. If the bulge, if the lid is bulging, throw it away. So on and so forth. Uh, you should trust your instincts on these. A uh, uh, good thing about canning meats that you have to remember it is a low acid food. That means there's not enough, not enough acidity in it for it to kill everything during its processing uh, phase when you're canning. So you cannot steam can it. You cannot water bath can it. You must pressure can it, which will put enough pressure and enough heat into the product that not only will it cook it but kill all the bacteria inside the canned item uh, and so it has to be pressure cooked follow the directions on any pressure canner and you'll learn exactly what you need for what type of meat so on and so forth uh, so canning is probably for the food storage person who wants to keep uh, keep meats in, in without having to refrigerate them is the best way. Uh, canned meats like this that are home canned and pressure canners will last about three years. And of course the last method once again <laughs> and, and how many people know what this is? I'll tell you what first person who tells me what this symbol means will get something. I will give them something. I will give them a, a book of their choice of, of all the books I've got. I've got the Stockpile Cafe. I've got Bug Out Boot Camp. I've got the Hurricane Preppers Guide. I've got the, the Seasonal Kitchen Companion. I've got uh, SHTF Stories. I've got uh, the Preppers Cookbook. Uh, list book of lists. I've got the blackout book. I've got several books that are based upon homesteading and preparedness that uh, That I will be happy to give you one of those yours of choice Whoever just tell can tell me what this symbol means And this is a food preservation Symbol and it's out there right now Fake meat? Close. No, it's not fake meat. Uh, this is a food preservation method for not only meat, but all foods. And if you want to, if you want a, uh, um, a hint, this is the process of all food that goes up to astronauts in the space station. It's not GMO meat. You guys are getting close. Brined meat and fermented. No dig guard. Nope. Nope. Uh. Deborah E. said, My grandpa saw had a huge pickle barrel full of dill pickles. Yeah, you stuck your hand in, got a pickle you wanted. My grandma would once a week skim off the top each week. Yeah, people weren't worried about stuff back in those days. I remember getting pickles as a kid. Freeze dried. Nope. That's not it. It's not freeze dried food. Think of the worst way you could preserve food, and this is it. Uh, the one thing you don't want to do, but the government is doing to your food right now. Uh, Christy Betts, send me an email. You are the winner. It's irradiation, it's nuke food. Uh, send me an email breakawayhomesteader at gmail.com and whatever you want I will send it to you and uh, I will I will send you whatever this is something that you all guys need to know and I told you guys you'd learn something this evening this is a symbol that you need to look out for on all your fruits and vegetables 
on, on, on all foreign food products and even meat products. Okay, I'm going to fl flip forward here real quick. Irradiation or sending gamma, alpha, beta rays through food. Nuclear x-rays to food. This is the stuff they do to your, your mail when you send it to the government. They irradiate it to make sure there's nothing in it and it kills all bacteria for uh, anthrax, for smallpox, stuff like that. And so if mail gets through that has any type of bugs on it, it kills it. They want to start doing this to your food, folks. Oh, did Chip get it right? I didn't. I wasn't. I was paying to do 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 do. Looking for chip signal. Yeah. Oh, built on chasing life. Let me write this. Built on. B i l t o n g. Built on. Home setting. Freeze dried. Irradiate. Christy, I think you're the only one that got it. Uh, if Chip Signal got it, he's got my email. He can email me too. I'll send him a book as well. Uh, would be the first time he's won a book. So they want to start irradiating your food. The same thing to do to your mail to kill bacteria. People have been having issues with E. coli. That's because this produce has been coming from foreign nations that literally do raw sewage and raw poop onto your food. Uh, fertilizer should be fermented. Fertilizer should be aged to the point to where there's no bacteria left in it that's going to harm you. And if you do that properly, check out the Humanure Handbook. Uh, if you do that properly, uh, it's fine. But all these foreign countries, they, they put raw sewage on food to fertilize it. And that's what causes E. coli spike. And, and so what they want to do now is irradiate your food. They want to nuke your food, literally nuclear radiation into your food. These are the rays you're avoiding when a nuclear bomb goes off. You're in a bomb shelter so you don't get exposed to these, uh, these types of rays, right? Let me move on to the next picture. So here's funny. This is a funny little little clip here. And it says weaponized food. Fresh farm produce. And you can see the little radiation signals on there. And this, this chick's like, um, what's going on here? And eventually this could be a thing to where you won't have a choice but to eat this crap. This is why you need to start making a garden and making your own food as well. So let me pull that back. And so one day you could be this guy. You could see this guy salivating over a hamburger that is glowing green. And here's the thing about, so here's the issue about irradiated food. If you get exposed to alpha, beta, gamma rays, right? If you get exposed to these harmful radiation rays, it changes you. That's how you get cancer. Cancer is a mu mutation of cells. So your cells are mutating because uh, you're being exposed to these rays. So what do you think it's doing to the food? It's mutating the, the, the cells. Imagine eating cancer because that's exactly what it's, what it's doing. And it's, it's, very, it's something very serious that you guys need to pay attention to. So if you see this symbol again, I want you to ask and find out exactly where it came from. And, you know, contact me and say, hey, what's going on? I found this here. So there's a there's an initiative out there. And it says, don't nuke our food. And, uh, and so, guys, just pay attention to that. It's going to happen. Just watch. Yep. Uh, Chip Signal says it changes male sperm. We could be giving birth to aliens with, or humans with tails, or three-headed kids, or whatever. But, but it's, it's no joke. I'm laughing about it, and it terrifies me that my kids or my grandkids one day will be so to the point 
to where you know there's a 100 percent disease rate 100 percent cancer rate the chances of you surviving past 60 would be like 50 50 you know these are the things this this is the way our society and our our bodies as humans are culturally are are not culturally but physically going to we're dying at a younger age now because we don't watch what we put into our bodies because we don't realize that hey those cheetos that you have have eaten have cellulose in them what's cellulose oh it's it's part of a tree well, you know and it is terrifying changing life and it's uh yeah your mail is irradiated if you ever get a, a package in the mail or you know what color paper is supposed to look right if it's an off like eggshell yellow color like a uh uh like a past not a pastel color but like if it's an off yellow color chances are it's been irradiated and it does hold a small amount of radiation inside of it it's very scary so out of all these preservation methods folks what is the number one way of preservation uh, of your meats uh, out there this is the number one way you're gonna know 100% without a doubt that your meat is fresh and I'm sure you guys have already guessed it that is keeping them alive listen folks if you have animals the best way to keep them fresh is to keep them alive uh, people did this on ships uh, they put produce in the, well, not only produce but they would put live animals on the ship and they would slaughter them as they needed them on long journeys overseas <laughs> that's cellulitis uh, uh, big bear homestead <laughs> so people would take animals and place them on their on their uh, their ships on their voyages it's it's nothing new uh, here's another picture here's a picture of a little girl on a ship uh, um, it could be a cabin boy I don't know uh, feeding chickens on a ship and they kept them alive because that's that's one best way to keep them fresh it's no hassle to clean up after animals because you uh, grew up that way you grew up with animal husbandry so that you were growing your animals so why not keep them around why not keep them alive and keep them near you so you know it's a cold night you've got heat you got body heat it, uh, you're starving you got food obviously there's other multiple reasons why to keep animals alive and so uh, again I'll, I don't want to apologize out to those vegans out there that are calling me out and going I can't believe we're talking about meat meat bad for you and no good and and we're all gonna go to hell because we're eating animals and we shouldn't be eating each other cannibalism all that good stuff uh, keep your stuff to yourself this is just about uh, what the majority of the population does uh, they preserve me pre preserve me to eat uh, and I got one last picture for you guys and that's uh, this is a call this is a cattle ship so this ship particular this particular ship goes in between uh, uh, Europe Africa and Australia this is an Australian cattle ship and they will load thousands upon thousands of cattle onto this basically large barn that's a floating across the ocean and this is how the world gets fed fresh stuff and so if this were all frozen it would have to be refrigerated it would have to be kept frozen the amount of energy it would take to keep that meat frozen would be too much to have a good profit and so what do they do they keep them alive and then they take them to wherever they need to take them and then they go from there uh, so this is even a modern day way to keep your meat fresh and so if there's ever an SHTF situation and you have rabbits you have chickens you have other animals so on and so forth use them to the best of their ability and uh, when the time's right you know, take care of it and use them all the way to their ability eat them 
Um, but that's pretty much it. I think that's the last picture I got. I'll check here real quick. Yep, that's the last one. Close that guy out here. So, do -do 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 -do. take this off. Display capture. And so, folks, you guys got any questions or anything about what we talked about meat preservation tonight? I didn't talk about temperatures. I didn't talk about lengths of time that food keeps or anything like that. If I did, it's a suggestion. Don't take my word for it. Do your own research and uh, uh, and take that info and expand upon it yourselves because this is the type of research you should be doing uh, to prepare yourselves for what may or may not happen. So if you got any questions, uh, right now is the time to be chatting yourself up, figure out what's going on. I've been talking offline with uh, Brad from Full Spectrum Survival, seeing what he's been up to, and uh, one of two things are going to happen tomorrow night, folks, and I'm going to announce his show tomorrow. He'll be on tomorrow night, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, he'll be doing one of two things. He may be having uh, a guest on talking about MREs or I might be on it really doesn't doesn't matter it's gonna be a good show either way so I suggest you guys watch his show 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time full spectrum survival Brad and Kelly are usually on there taking question answer questions and it's a great location to talk to other survival towards people, survival type people and homesteading people because we're kind of in the same genre. He usually has over 200 people on his show for when he does a live stream. And so it's a great place to find people that are local, maybe contact, maybe talk to other people. Because right now is the time to start talking people up to figure out and vetting folks to figure out exactly who you want to be close to when something happens. So let's see what's going on. <laughs> Big Bear Homestead post hosted that he will be doing a mock bug out uh, real soon. One thing about Big Bear Homestead uh, with his his uh, his wife and his children, uh, Robin, uh, Ladessa, Carol, and Blaze, and Jason, of course, uh, is they do drills. They do 1,800 days. They shut off the power. They'll live uh, a weekend without power. Just know what it's like. Take notes and do everything. They have binders set up for every specific emergency that you could think of. So if something happens, if they're not there, their own children can reach out and go, Okay, uh, the power went out. This is a checklist of things I need to do. Step one, I need to eat all the ice cream in the freezer. Fantastic. So... Maybe we ought to sit down and talk with uh, Big Bear and, uh, and and have a nice chat, live show with him, and talk about preparedness and maybe get this wheel started going again. Because it's spring, uh, it's time to start over again. What's old is dead, and what's new is new, and it's now coming to life. We need to think about that cycle that we have to go through every year and what kind of a cycle that we do uh, with our lives and what what may be happening with the cycle of the earth as well. Uh, weather pattern changes, so on and so forth. It's snow today here, folks. And it was, and then tomorrow's gonna be 75 degrees. It's crazy. So maybe we should get, start getting back to the whole preparedness side of things and start adding little things inside there. I owe you guys an apology. We have not been putting out videos. We've been working on a couple things and have been making videos behind the scenes that will be coming out soon. Um, uh, but uh, we're gonna we're gonna get more relative videos out there. Uh, as soon as I get bees again, we'll replace the bees in the bee uh, beehive. And this time, I probably won't get stung. Uh, hopefully, and we'll see how that goes. Um, we're gonna be hatching eggs soon as soon as i get my incubator we're going to be going and i'm going to take you guys with me to a flock swap 
This is where people exchange animals to continue on bloodlines without muddying up the bloodline so they have good stock. This is a place where bartering takes effect. And these are the types of things that we need to start learning and doing on our own. Uh, and stop relying so much upon technology to do those things for us. Because it might not be there. So, Chasing Life said that might be a great show idea. Uh, Betsy. Uh, Betsy, oh boy, guess I need to learn processing critters. Uh, Chasing Life said I have had issues with dog urine killing plants and grass. Uh, the poop would definitely be an annoyance for sure. Uh, dog dog urine has a high acidity and the only way to really do it is to know where he went or she went and be able to water it down quickly to dilute the uh, the amount of urea in that uh, which kills a plant. Um, so this has been good. Thank you uh, Grandma So Happy Homestead. Uh, need a broody hen for two broody hen or two for hatching eggs off grid yes you do um, but you know thing with eggs and chickens is if you find one chicken willing to lay on eggs you can put all the eggs underneath that chicken <coughs> chasing life yes grandma is really difficult when the family is not on board actually Brad and Kelly Talk about that too. Full spectrum survival show how to get people on board. Um, again, I will not only praise Brad and Kelly for their continued assistance with getting people on board with with the prepping, but I will also again refer you guys to uh, uh, the Survival Podcast. Um, and look up the Survival Podcast. Uh, the creator of the program is his name is Jack Spearco. And you can type in there uh, non-believers or people who are on board. And he does a whole podcast dedicated on the how. And, and he says, in the beginning of the po podcast, if you listen to my show, this is not for you. If you're listening to the show for the very first time, it's because somebody that I uh, broadcast to wants you to hear this. And he goes from step A all the way to step Z, uh, first talking about how important that person is to the other person so important that he would take his time out to have them listen to that broadcast because he feels this is an important subject that they may not may, might not think is important but it goes for the whole step of why it's important the five w's and it's it's pretty good and uh i'll talk to jack and i'll see if uh if i can post that um broadcast on my website and if i can i'll put it on there uh. <laughs> so folks I'm a breakaway homesteader my name is Patrick my wife Megan she was here earlier and our son Huxley want to wish you a great week and a happy spring uh, the first week of spring has been cold but it's promising to be a nice one and so hopefully your last last frost days are upon you and if they are it's time to plant 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 if you start seeds first of all be knowledgeable on how to start seeds if you've never started seeds before my suggestion would be to go buy plants uh, best place to buy plants are hardware stores because Bonnie's best uh, no longer makes the uh, the multiple trays where they have six tr six plants in one tray you buy that one tray now they're making single plants and they're selling them for about half the price of those multiple trays. They're wanting you to pay about $350 for one plant, which is ridiculous. If you're on a food assistance program, a SNAP program, some sort of government assisted program that is sponsored by the USDA, um, what's it, not the USDA, the, yeah, US Department of Agriculture, uh, do you have the right to use your benefits to buy uh, garden plants from Lowe's, from Walmart. I suggest Walmart because they're cheaper. But go to the gardening section, pick up Bonnie plants, and once you put them through the the uh, the till, there 
you can use those SNAP benefits, those food benefits, to buy those plants. We want you to grow your food uh, to where it's good for you, good for your family. And if you're on the government assistance, this is the best way to get the best bang for your buck. It'll take some time to get there, but plan ahead and buy those plants. Make yourself a garden. Make yourself a container garden. All it takes is a little time and a little effort, and I promise you the food that you get back will be tenfold what you would get by buying it at the store. So, with that being said, I want you guys to have a good week and get out there and do something. Do something preparedness every week to where if something does happen, you can ease yourself into that problem. If you lose a job, uh, if some, a family member gets sick, heck, my wife could have been hit by head on by a truck today. She would have been in the hospital out of a job uh, for, for a while. That would have been an issue for us. So, take care of each other and have a good night, folks. I'm going to go ahead and sign off. We'll see you next Tuesday. I'm not sure what the topic, the topic will be. Next Tuesday night, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We'll do a giveaway. Something. Something good. And uh, we'll have a subject out to you guys soon. Uh, if you haven't had the opportunity yet, go to my website, www.breakawayhomesteader.us and subscribe to my channel. Uh, you'll get a uh, newsletter every Wednesday uh, and then we will post a blog every Wednesday. I'm starting that back up again and getting the site up and running. Uh, our affiliate sites are... Uh, pipingrock.com and uh, seedsnow.com so if you haven't got your plants or your seeds it's a good place to go alright folks have a good evening and I am out